Okay. Now you just have to listen. It'll make a little bit more sense. Every last one of us have a certain amount of cerebral spinal fluid, blood, and brain tissue. Most of us adults have about 150 cc's of cerebral spinal fluid. Most of us adults have about 1,500 cc's of blood. And most of us have a significant brain tissue or you would have never made it this far. Those three can't go up or down. If one goes up, something else better come down. When we have a traumatic brain injury, a head injury, if, because this is not affected with an injury unless it's basilar, right? We agree this is not the one affected with just an injury. This is going to be affected with lumbar puncture, so all of this is going to make sense in a minute. But it's not affected with a brain injury. So far, so good? What is affected? Either the blood or the brain. So when we say swelling of the brain, you guys know we mean cerebral edema, don't you? Well, there's a problem with cerebral edema, and this is where we're going with this whole conversation. With cerebral edema, the brain is swelling. So who has to go down? It's not going to be cerebral spinal fluid. That's hard to decrease. So what is it going to be? It's going to be the blood flow. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to shut it down. Because you can't have everything out of order like that, out of balance. Now look, brain tissue swelling, vasoconstriction to the blood flow to the brain, and if you decrease the blood flow to the brain, you directly impact your level of consciousness. That's why you had to keep saying to yourself over and over, it's the first sign of ICP. So now you have brain swelling, you have flow of blood and oxygen to the brain going down, you have an increased ICP because of this crazy brain swelling, and when the brain swells, here we go, the ultimate complication of cerebral edema is herniation of the brain outside of the cranial cavity, which is crazy as hell. Because you've got to do something here. So if you are getting this herniation of the brain, then you know you've got a lot less blood flow. Do we agree? Okay, so here we go. We're going to operate on that. When we look at shock versus ICP, which is what this handout is telling you, when we look at ICP versus shock, if I tell you your patient is going to go into shock, the first thing that's going to happen with shock is going to be tachycardia. Now, I'm going to make sure I draw that because it can be confusing. I'm going to draw it up here, guys. Watch this. At the top of this X is my shock arms. This is all shock. The first thing that happens is a high pulse. A late vital sign change is a low blood pressure. So on your shock side, what does it say? Okay, now the one thing I got a problem with that side of the paper with is you see the word shock, I got a problem with that because not all shocks are created equal. I just told you neurogenic shock is all vital signs low. So I don't even like the fact that they put shock, they should have put which kind. Make sure you do. It's hypovolemic. Hypovolemic shock, this is the second problem I got with that little handout. If you look under the label of shock, what is the first one that they wrote? Yeah, that ain't what's going to happen first. Blood pressure is not what's going to happen first. So take that pulse, highlight it, and put first. 
because the pulse is going to go up first. The second thing that happened is that the blood pressure drops. The third thing that happened is what is the patient doing with their breathing? Huh? Increase? It should say increase. Okay, cool. Now stay with your girl. That was shock. Come on over here. Again, first was a pulse change. Which way? High. Last was a low blood pressure. Which way? It went down. Okay, these arms, these arms, are my ICP. For this patient with the ICP, what is going to happen first is not even an option on the paper, and that's important. What did I tell you was gonna happen first? LOC. Now here's why that's not an option because you really got to hear me on this. The reason why it's not an option is because if you have, and this is what this handout is, if you have, please highlight it, Cushing's triad, highlight it. If you have a Cushing's triad at the top of the page, top of the page, highlight it. Yep. If you have a Cushing's triad, your patient is deteriorating. They've been done with the LOC. That was a long time ago. You need to make sure on a scale of one to 10, one being on new admission after injury, that was when you saw the LOC. On a scale of one to 10, Cushing's triad was 10. It was right before they died. So we did LOC already. It don't need to be on the page because that was assumed. But what I still want you to say and put it at the top of the page above increased ICP, First equals decrease LOC. This is deteriorating. Your test wants to know that you know you don't see Cushing's triad on hardly anybody unless they're dying. This is a very bad late, 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 late sign. Ominous, we call it. See, don't I go with that in your class? It's ominous over and over. I keep telling you, ominous. Okay. Now, so come with me because it's ominous, okay? Here we go. ICP, this side of the arm is going to trade places. That's why that packet said it's the opposite. Instead of a low, we have a high. Instead of pulse being first, we made the BP first. So when we say it's opposite, we're saying the first vital sign change with shock was pulse. Here we're saying the first vital sign change with Cushing's triad was blood pressure. We're saying with shock, the blood pressure was low. We're saying with ICP, the blood pressure is high. Are we together? Okay. So tell me which way the pulse is going to go here. Well, yes. You've got a bradycardia. With ICP, your arrow goes down, your pulse switches places, instead of being the first vital sign change, it's gonna be the last. Now, here's our deal. If you go to the ICP side of your paper, now you're gonna write this triangle. You're gonna write high B, P, low, Pulse, widen, pulse pressure. I said that earlier. Who had a narrow pulse pressure? Cardiac tamponade. You went to take the blood pressure, started off on 40 over 80. You did it 15 minutes later, 160 over 50. See how wide it got? Cardiac tamponade gets narrow. Just the opposite. Okay, now, triad means triangle. High BP, low pulse, widened pulse pressure. And if the respirs are increased with shock, what are they with this? 
if they're decreased with ICP, will the patient have respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis? Acidosis, very good. Hypoventilation is acidosis. Hyperventilation is alkalosis. Write it. Respiratory acidosis is your head injury patient. Respiratory acidosis because of the hypoventilation. Respiratory acidosis because of the hypoventilation. On this page, anywhere you want, because it's a big page, put a lot of shit on it. I want you to put lumbar puncture because I'm going to go over those same things again. Just put lumbar puncture. I don't really give a shit where you put it. First of all, make sure you know it's contraindicated with a high ICP. Lumbar puncture, contraindicated with a high ICP. Now, here's what I left on the board on purpose. I left cerebral spinal fluid, blood, and brain tissue. When I do a lumbar puncture, I take cerebral spinal fluid out. Would we all agree? So I disrupted the balance, right? When I took this out, uh-oh, what has to go up? It ain't gonna be a damn brain. Blood, how does that go up? Stays all dilation. How did it go down? Vasoconstriction. When it goes up, I just told you all headaches are vasodilation. I just told y'all that. That's why this patient has a spinal headache because the blood had to increase. The blood vessels had to vasodilate to allow more blood how do you combat that? You give lots of fluid to the lumbar puncture patient. You push fluids. Because if I push fluids, my whole body has more water. Water controls blood pressure. I'll vasoconstrict to lower it. Okay, I'm going to try that again. Lumbar punctures, very much at risk for a spinal headache. Why? Because you took water out, cerebral spinal fluid out. And now your body is vasodilating to accommodate the loss in the fluid. What do you do so they don't perceive there's a loss in fluid? Push fluids. Fill the patient up with lots of water. That's going to make you not vasodilate. Also, what else can we do for the spinal headache patient? Keep them flat. Remember on your exam, lumbar punctures need to lay flat eight hours. Eight hours after lumbar puncture, keep your patient flat because if I stand up, I'm going to leak more fluid through gravity. If I lay back, I'll regenerate the fluid. Another trick for your spinal headache patient having had a lumbar puncture, caffeine. We treat headaches with caffeine. So flush fluids, flush the patient with fluids. Keep them supine eight hours and caffeine and insects if they're allowed. Those are how you take care of this patient with the lumbar puncture. What was the position for the lumbar puncture itself? Left lateral, what was that also called? Fetal position. So that's on this exam too. A lumbar puncture and here we go, a myelogram are very similar. Lumbar puncture and myelogram, very similar. Here's the difference. With a lumbar puncture, I took water out. With a myelogram, I put dye in. You do not have to keep a myelogram patient flat. You can have the head of the bed up, because why? I didn't take any fluid out, did I? I didn't take any water out. Why am I making them lay flat? It's stupid. So the head of the bed can be up a little bit. Okay. All right. This is done for spinal cord injury, as you probably know.
Okay. All right, moving along. Let's see what we got here.